Tony. Summon the situation. The explosive torrent of lightning made by both Cartagon commanders jump backwards in an attempt to evade it. The sudden lag stopped them both from obliterating their specific targets. Yare, yare. Yeah. Trifa was the only one to welcome the situation with open arms. Even Kay, the one who unwittingly broke the mask with her embrace, was completely dumbfounded. Machina and Eleanor also reacted accordingly. For one was gloomy and the other awed. Both of them displayed blood and surprise at the abrupt appearance of the giant. They both stared at him, unable to gauge the corpse warrior's intentions. The cadaver charged forward with the force of a cannonball, blasting away the floor of the roof. His target was obviously the staggering priest with a rice right on his face, Valeria Trifa. Why was the man so receptive to the game yet another enemy? There was only one reason for that. <laughs> the Iron Negro disliked those getting in the way of his battles more than anything else, as any warrior surely would. And the priest knew that the Crimson Rebel wouldn't ignore what she had just seen. The abrupt two-way, no, four-way battle was far too much for Kay to process and hardly anyone could blame her for that. A roar of lightning rent the sky as the Calver launched an attack with its lumbering greatsword. Instead of the priest cover, it hit and blew away Eleanor, who waved into the fight. Hmm. Machina wasn't moving. He looked up at the gen before him with no visible expression on his face. With those words, Trifa withdrew by leaping out of the somber night's reach. The barrier engulfing the whole school was flickering and becoming unstable. Trifa fixed his eyes on Tubalkine. For reasons unknown, he stopped his purchase and pursuit of the priest and remained still. It seemed like he was able to choose his target. Huh? The cadaver's giant spoke in a voice that seemed to shake the very ground beneath. The hinter? What? His body was trembling under the wave of the inner conflict scorching his being. What made him act like that? Why was the corpse hesitating? This demon left many questions to be asked, but one thing was obvious, even without an answer. Kine's current targets were Trifa and one other, the engineer of Hell Sheet, who was blown away by the Calvers' previous strike. Suddenly, an eruption of crimson flames shook the vicinity. Shama. Shama da to. Well, Nor instantly blew away the curtain of dust, adorned a mantle of hellfire, and proved her chest full of arrogance. The blow from Kain was by no means light, yet she was standing as if it didn't hurt her at all. She had no impenetrable shield, like Trifa did, as such the situation was born from a simple difference in power. The amount of souls housed in Kain's blow was smaller than Elnor's, there was nothing more to it than that. After the priest sounded a laugh, seeing his unique sort of jazz. The cops were finally decided on who he must strike. <laughs> the next discharge of thunderous lightning was directed at Eleanor. Even while exposed to the throne to search, the woman stood still and composed. Until she released an enraged shout. 
Shizu Marei! Her voice surpassed. Even the thunder strikes roar. It literally made the lightning shatter and fade away like mist. After which the barriers around the school began to flicker even more violently. Kozakashi. Kozakashi zo Kristof. Daga ii daro. Notte yaru. Watashi no ori ga hiraku shunkan o nerau to yu nara neratte miro. Deru mo hairu mo sono toki nara chizai. Ai mo kawarazu nige no sandan dake wa tashsha na mono da. Shikashi nan ni seyo. Kisama ni kishi kaisei nado okori en. Hmm. The potency of the cage ceiling everyone within was lower to the bare minimum as Eleanor redirected more of her power to assist here. Her, with the upcoming battle, the woman's dedication to the fight was a clear show of her will to go all up. <laughs> huh. The realization filled Kay with absolute terror and pressure that seemed to shatter her bones. Compared to what Eleanor was now, the woman she talked to just a moment ago was blind. However, the girl couldn't back out if she fell to her knees here and now everything she had done so far would have been for naught. After all... Eleanor's target was kind. Kay couldn't just let it go, so she mastered the willpower to fight, raise her sword and face the Crimson Knight just for the second time. Elnor ignored Kay's determination and sounded a laugh. The woman looked at the two fighters standing up before her and chuckled in a visitor's manner as if she just had heard a poorly went joke. その出来損ないは大変わりする。複製の清掃に見入られて、それを想像した一族を松井まで食らい潰すという代物だったな。確か、ベベルスプルグロンギンス。差し詰め。劣化品のエインフェリア製造機というわけだ。Elnor looked up at the giant hunk of iron held high by Kine. She seemed amused at first, but then heaved a sigh of disappointment, like that of a teacher giving up on an irredeemably poor student. ならば貴様の前に当たる桜井は男だったのか。レオンハルト。父か兄か。どちらでも良いがね。彼と言うならそうなのだろう。まったく。傑作だな、おい。何が。Funny? She tried to ask that question before realizing that Eleanor owner wasn't even looking at her. The last sentence was aimed at him, standing next to her. Oh. Kay began to feel as though something was critically off. She considered that she might be harboring a monumental misunderstanding. After all, the Crimson One was the only one to be amused by her referring to Kine as him. Becoming aware of a certain possibility, Kay looked up at the giant. Her mentality made it impossible for her to not, not to display that reaction. Elon let her to do it, and Kay was pitiful, unable, unable to resist. It was objectively one of the greatest failures she had ever made. <laughs> In a ridiculously extreme state of tension between them, Kay looked away from Eleanor, even severing her attention to her. An error that grave could never have bigger consequences. <laughs> a fireball was hurled towards Kay, blowing her away with ease. At the very same moment, Kain hauled a battle cry at Eleanor, seemingly think his intention to sacrifice himself in order to protect Kay. <laughs> she reached out towards the giant, calling out to him in a hoarse voice, but alas, it was all to foot heal. The blue K received was powerful enough to leave her with a critical injury, but the dis it distanced her from Kine. That harsh reality, as well as Elnor's words from early, made the woman's intentions clear. Hmm. Rubedo was going to evaporate Kine and leave the girl a lie to have her become the sacrifice to the eighth. No, don't go, don't leave me! Would her own powerlessness make K lose someone dear to her again? Kay fought so hard to overturn the burdening past. 
only to be met with the very same conclusion. There was no way the guy could tolerate it. <laughs> Her laugh tinted with joy grew in proportion to ever expanding flames. Uh, that laughter really is ridiculously bad. Someone should tell them that. Really, Eleanor wasn't even looking at Kay. She stared intently at the giant corpus of the charging Kalba, her gaze harboring unmistakable affection. However, the love of Enkariar's immortal champion would fall and was. Suddenly she snapped her fingers. Oh, we are saying, through the Valkyrie, Kirhaizen. That mark her final goodbye. But did it work? Because there is a trick that he might have survived actually. She, you know, kind. The, the sack was too intense, transient, and gruesome to be likened to a burning candlelight. The blade scorched away all of his hair and gradually evaporated the whole corpus. Nothing could save him now. Are you sure? She was completely shocked with the shattering of her desire. The girl's days would be followed by overwhelming despair and no doubt an impulse to give up on life. It was the most natural course of action for someone to so utterly defeated and drained of hope. However, there was one thing about her. The powerless foolish girl had a single virtue which could never be denied. Her will to reject the ends. Her borderline abnormal stubbornness, her lack of perceptiveness to the point of rejecting the light of understanding. Lost tragedy agony ruin, even while burdened by such things, case struggles curved and refused to give up. Liza's evaluation of the girl, calling her a fragile blade of glass, was both right and wrong at the same time. Case Sakura was indeed fragile and dangerously quick to break, yet even after she was ground to death, she refused to accept it. Or rather, she would forget the reality of her own downfall the very moment it happened. So, the girl recovered from her boat of despair. Garo shattered piece of her heart and launched an attack with all the soul and power she could master. Any sane mind would recognize her action as futile. No matter how much of her life Kay would fervently sacrifice, she could never land a decisive blow on the woman who was easily able to repel an attack from Kain. Ignore that, however, the fact still remained that Eleanor was now wide open for a strike. Annihilating Kain was with her flames at full power made her momentarily become still. No matter how strong a person might be, everyone has seen in their awareness. This case action was outside of Eleanor's expectations. She saw the girl as a worthless cur. She thought that shattering Kay's heart would be enough to end her. However, what actually happened completely betrayed her assumptions. The woman never would have guessed that the girl's foolishness and lack of understanding went much farther than she had first thought. And nor could not dodge in the attack. Case Sharlach Roth crossed the burning giant and slashed at the tall female commander with a scorching burst. An explosive scarlet ring shook the whole school area as the weakened cage of flames disappeared. I agree. Hence, the man awaiting this moment offered a genuinely sincere word of praise to the one responsible. Acknowledging any such hindrances as drifting, Nigel remained forty and faced as he raised his destructive arm fist in the air. Indeed, the event was a triviality. Whether or not the cage was open, the somber night's deadly part was descending. If he couldn't do anything to neutralize, Trifa had no chance of winning or surviving. 
Was there anything you could do? The answer was simple and clear. So if I evade the generous wind of the overwhelming strike by a hair's brief, and then gun by time until the new actor arrives at the scene. No matter what Machina said, the boy's arrival would make him change his target. The tension of his former surpassed the knight's reason. After all, he was doing everything he could, do, he could to avoid any encounters until they both were at their best. At that time, the priest bet everything on that event, as it was the only possible way of shifting the circumstances in his favor. However, Berlo Shingen, the champion of Iron, dreamed and chuckled in a way reminiscent of Airfan, rumbles. Though he had an evident liking for two fast attempts to struggle, he also displayed a clear pity for him. Step by step, with no caution, he closed in on the priest. For the somber knight could almost reach him with his hand, he didn't display the least bit of care about it. What did he mean by that? The answer to the question paralyzed Trifa with shock. <laughs> the small young boy danced estaf ecstatically in the air, dashing, jumping, and running on empty space as his piercing after resounded throughout the surroundings. All he left in the wake of his sprint was a mountain trail of corpses. He was a hurricane of blood, moving down and greatly consuming everyone regardless whether they were in their homes, cars or just out on the streets. He displayed no concern for the locations of the remaining swastikas or the sacrifices that are required. The release from the castle made Albert's body tremble with joy as he obeyed the impulse to fulfill his desire for slaughter. He was the very reason why the person Trifa waited for would never make it in time. Hmm. Gerd was certain that in his current state Ren could never get past Albedo due to critical problem in compatibility. Hmm. Fred and Mari were riding Shiro's motorbike from the chair to school when a certain person intercepted them. They didn't forget about the ancient boy, but. From the air above us, Shriba dropped down the bike with extreme speed, instantly shattering it while we got off in the nick of time. His track was absolutely fast, even for a surprise track. With Mari in my embers and the ground slid to a, to to a stop before shipping my gaze to the blazing motorbike. <laughs> I might have seen Kong above for wit, but there were chills running down my spine. After all, I didn't see Schreiber anywhere. And it was because he became invisible or went into hiding or the like. He was just pretty ridiculously. He was Schreiber of the storm winds, swifter than anyone, too fast to be perceived. The air itself released thunderous explosive bursts as the buildings and asphalt shattered. It felt almost like the rampage of an invisible giant. Not really giant. The actual cause was a gravity defying ultra fast barrage of jumps on all the possible surfaces. The city was gradually becoming a mountain of ruin as that one person was running around at a speed surely able to break escape velocity. It looked like the nightmare realization of some sick joke. A remarkably fierce impact broke the asphalt and made it collapse into the shape of the crater. A reflex if you look at the location where it happened and finally saw him. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, wait, you're, well, you still are a brat. A 
feminine and face, not really, and voice to accompany small and slender body, not yet of the age to exhibit any secondary sexual characteristics. However, he is one I was born with countless emotions, passions, and sentiments. Grief, hatred, regret, joy, pleasure, satisfaction, a to quagmire beyond any proper evaluation. It looked human, but it was like a completely different animal, or better yet, a clothed walking, talking calamity. Fran got the very same impression that Shiro described. Conversing with the spheres, Fink was a fool's errand. With things having come to this, I could do but one thing. I had to defeat him fast, not sparing a single moment, then go to the school as soon as I could. <laughs> Our gaze met, I looked into his eye and saw not even the most eager hint of sanity. I was certain that no human, beast, or even demon should have eyes like that one. So I. It was the glare of an insect completely obsessed with slaughter and sadism. If the world had anything repulsive in it, it was really the eye and the harrowing life that nurtured it. He was not a being that should be kept alive, and not a distortion that should be tolerated. For his kind was unlike the others, he was truly another one of hell's inhabitants. How many tens of thousands did he massacre for his eye to have that glint? How much land did he bath in to end up so irredeemably insane? I looked around and saw the city, its streets broken and hollowed, just by running about, Schreiber had killed people whose numbers had truly surpassed hundreds. Rage built up within me, the feeling of disdain made me dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Behind my clenched teeth, the inside of my mouth got filled with the taste of blood. I had to stop him, no matter what. Schreiber <laughs> bent his body meter. It was likely that his extreme speed completely nullified the need for footholds. Ren immediately assumed a stance as Albedo's voice and tone changed, his grin replaced with something far more sinister. After all, the Ashen boy had always made a point of responding to any murder scene that aimed him with bloodlust a hundred times more intense. <laughs> We'll see about that. There was a reason why he couldn't defeat him. Because that was the very nature of the mad and Albedo's craving. Well named his creation figment, Ren had absolutely no chance of managing victorious. The very same could be said for her. With no change in her expression, Rubedo usually left the bursting flames. <laughs> Astonishment, that was the only thing, swirling within case mind. Were they actually mortal? Elnor took K's blow while in a completely defenseless state, neither her mind nor body even began to consider the possibility of being attacked. And yet this was the result, her uniform was slightly dirty, but not an inch of her body was hurt. Elnor spoke in a dispassionate manner while extinguishing the flames over Kain's ash. Her tone sounded almost as if she planned to instruct the girl. ゼーで核力など組んでも意味がなかろう。兵力で劣るなら使い方を工夫しろ。それ次第で穴を埋がつことも悪いはできる。貴様は無駄が多いのだよ。まったく。そんなところはどこかの穴法とよく似ているわね
old elder sister talking to a younger one. The reality that she aligned the woman's presence with that of her dearest treasures appropriately appealed to her. The object that appeared from the extinguished flames made the girl's eyes open wide. Wedelsburg Longinus, two Balkanis acting under by Prince Verifin's form, remaining completely unstated. The fact that it shrunk to a third of its original three meter lamp slightly perplexed her, but aside from that, there was nothing abnormal about it, not even a scratch. <laughs> There's a secret in that sword. There's a secret in that sword. I know about it. It was completely momentary. <laughs> Kay wasn't letting her guard down, nor was she looking away from the woman. Her thoughts weren't a stable enough to, for her to compose or co to be composed, but she was still completely ready to fight. And yet, one way or another, she was still caught off guard. Eleanor stood right before Kay and placed one of her hands on the girl's shoulder. The situation wasn't caused by the woman's speed. It was only the clarity of her martial arts prose, which made the girl think that there likely was time when her adversary used to repent her melee abilities. There was no greater proof than the reality of her effortlessly invading Kay's a swordsman's fighting range. Tooth the fight was over. <laughs> The woman hit her with enough might to instantly make a girl black out. Her limbs failed to move and she couldn't even voice a response. The defeat was so overwhelming that Kay felt more dumbfounded than humiliated. She had no excuse. Another sighed and raised her face. Hey. The rooftop's other battle was about to reach its end as well. Energy colored with an Estigian black fist. An extraordinary amount of souls were around it. He became magic and the under agency for sorry, genesis of an outer world. Creation figment. The manifested person's greatest craving, a secret rite of sorcery that turned one into all. They wish to become something and they desire to do something, they are self and the way it exists. The creation of a world meant to fulfill such cravings, a place where his desire would be common absolute rule. A certain someone was inclined to despise light, so he wished for an eternal night for him to reign within. And there had a passion so dear she wished for it to become an ever burning star within her breast. Hegemony and transcendence. Both were dreams, but one was an ambition that spread and consumed others, while the other was desire to emphasize the self. The former changed the space itself, while the other only affected the body. Hegemony was more fiendish as a calamity, while the prayer of transcendence was more menacing as an art of battle. After all, a desire that didn't consume any outsiders could never decline and weaken due to conflicting logic. His was an ultra high class transcendence. Negro's craving was the end. Anyone who ever touched his face would have the curtain fall on the story of their life. The phenomenal man, the end of his story. Creatures, objects, knowledge, concepts, none of those categories matter to it. Nothing with even a single one of history past the point of its creation, a single word in its story could ever withstand the Oleg's day ending, Deus Ex Machina. There's a little earned machina, the title of God from the machine. His strike meant immediate death, and was dangerous beyond human conception. <laughs> of course, Rufa fully understood the gravity of his situation. The plot he planned out had been thoroughly torn apart. 
Brain Fuji, his only ray of hope was unable to come. He could never break through Schreiber. Based on Machina's nature, the priest assumed that he would never let anyone else have his prey. And he wasn't wrong. The maddened dog was unable to suppress his urge for slaughter. Any words telling him not to kill someone would always fall on deaf ears, and a scenario where he would kill Ren was completely undesirable to Machina. Two Strif assumed that they would never be made to face each other in battle, unless it was but a naive notion. After all, the Madden Hood was nothing but a real dog before the gold's presence. Upon Driva's death, the Hrode Vetnir would be fixed in by the bindings of Gleipnir. He considered continued evasion until Ren's life was endured by Stryber and Machina grew impatient. However, it had become completely impossible. For Ren, all ending craving was about to be made manifest before him. The, the evocation was nearing its end, although he was still cheat hunting the area, and Igrel wasn't the kind of man to allow his enemies escape. A weak offense would have received a powerful counterattack. While trying to escape would only result in the blood seeking out his back, there was only one thing left for him to do. Hmm. He had to respond with his full power. It was the only path he would take, and its final destination was clear as daylight. The priest no longer waits for a turn around. Well, well, the trifle had been completely checkmated. The humanoid incarnation of death spoke with indifference as he clenched his all ending fist. Machina's attacks ignored any defenses and could be unleashed countless times. As long as he was on the offensive, God's von Baroshingen was unparalleled. I don't see anything holy about your crusade. He raised a face that made all curtains fall. It was hard to know if the words he spoke before the bears were intentional. Nevertheless, they completely crushed the deepest part of Trifa's being. They were neither verbal abuse nor provocation, only the cold, harsh truth. <laughs> His scream was of a sanguine tone. The somber fist and the golden palm clashed with a thunderous explosive sound. After the violent impact, Trifa's right hand perfectly healed the up until the moment before ended up blatantly crushed. However, what ultimately crumbled was not his body, but his control over the divine vessel. The shield was annihilated and the armor was ignored, as part of the souls inhabiting the borrowed flesh were completely shattered. The priest had been rendered unable to move a single muscle of the arm that clashed with Machina's fist. However, he didn't seem to grieve his wretched condition at all. Distance by the blow of the enemies faced one another, building an invisible world of battle lost in the space between them. His density made the pavement of the roof begin to crack and shook the whole campus into a violent rumble. Trifa gathered his evolve. 
There was only one thing left for him to do, he had to disregard all causes of anxiety and unleash the weapon he trusts more than anything else. The priest's whole body and soul. His ultimate skill. The expanding event he didn't even make the iron Negro of flinch. He simply continued talking with a tranquil voice that almost seemed to harbor pity. He was an inferior of the demon in Valhalla, a being unable to escape the rule of gold, and such December night of Minor could have been weak to Trifa's ultimate attack. Once again, he summoned the sacred lance. The reason why he erased it in the first place was simply because it opened a fatal weak point. No one could draw their blade when clutching the ultimate hammer and wielding the greater shield to go on the offensive with their full intent to murder and notifying one's own defenses. Fully aware that Trifa still drew his blade, after all, his men ignored defenses either way. As such, the priest's best bet was to discard them and focus entirely on the offensive. It was the most obvious course of action for anyone facing Machina. Even for the action hardly suited him at all. The choice had become far too obvious. Using his creation figment for the second time in one night made his soul wear some vivid shrieks, but he splendidly ignored them all. He wouldn't die, he couldn't allow himself to perish, he couldn't accept defeat no matter what. On the transit moment before their ultimate attacks clashed. <laughs> Magna's words pierced deep into Trifa's heart. They left an injury far more critical than any physical wound. Pure light surged throughout the sacred golden lance. By believing them shine to be absolute, that Trifa was contradicting himself. <laughs> While well, believing the power he was blessed with to be without equal, he made light of the originator. The priest fixed his lord's might into a framework he could understand. He was thwart as both a rebel and a borrower of his master's power. Blessed with rank outside his might, he used it to attempt to see the very same person that granted it. Having such a deserted desire required both absolute acknowledgement and a certain amount of underestimation of the target. As one who had never possessed his own power, the ability to grasp victory, he had to contradict himself by believing in both the strength and weakness of his enemy. The priest passionately cut strength, but instead of perfecting himself, he chose to become someone else entirely. That weakness was the greatest display of Valeria Tripa's limits. He was only killed, something that could never become gold. <sighs> Tusk had awakened to the fact that despite his desire to save all and never be robbed of anything again, the Divine Vizor was the Lord of Destruction. The materialization of all destroying Desiree. He called out to her, Lisa and the Countess sorrowful loaves that just slipped through her fingers. His snatch brought ruination upon anyone he had ever wished to save. His love was the harbinger of destruction, nothing more. Six years ago, Calcraft declared that to be the applied. Pardoning the weak saint since his very first brief. Tus. The sacred lance he deemed absolute failed to hit the target. The sober knight displayed no hint of fear towards the golden line that scrapped his shoulder and latched his dark and iron face at the one who released it. Tus the curtain would fall. Nothing but the life of the Jester falling the warm sanctity was true. The one the uh, all ending strike reached his chest marked the descent of the true gold. The bishop was shattered and came a pile of ways on the chessboard. Reinhardt looked down at it and squinted at his eyes. Seeing himself on the throne of his castle, he whispered with a languid smile at his visage. He loved all and everything, all would be consumed and nothing left unravaged. 
And now the world of his began to spread and expand. Wavering fragments sifting the devilish castle of Wevelsburg made itself corporeal. It was a hell from the souls of millions. She was the incarnation of war, the one to recolor the world within with sanguine chaos. And Rebellion praising the chant of the prayer, giving a blazing welcome to the coming of the moment he, her supreme overlord had always yearned for. The moment made Albedo forget his dull last. Prioritizing his loyalty over the raging pulse within him, he became ecstatic as he stole his battle for the sake of his lord, the man who once let him live. Nigrado was no exception. He was yet another one of the eight carriers enslaved and bound by the castle. The golden beast cherished the loyalty of his subjects, laughing as he spared his boundless hell. He marched to consume the whole world. Tus Bohal made it descend upon the earth. It was a fate carved into stone. An inescapable, inescapable, sorry, inescapable, unavoidable reality that dated back to the founding of the city. The chaos bloating out the sky gave birth to a mystifying castle that robbed the souls of any and all weaklings unable to resist its sorcery. The event was a repeat of what occurred in Berlin over 60 years ago. The scores of war demons who were absorbed by and merged with the devious castle wrote a cheering chant. Zeke Heil. Zeke Heil. Zeke His locks like floating mane, golden in color. His regal gaze, equally golden. It was the god of splendor, a brilliant, surpassing creation itself, beauty mingled with heavy solemnity yet at the same time basely in hue. A being that should not exist in the realm of man, the harbinger of beginning lies. Returned to the corporeal call of his own flesh, Reinhard Heydrich looked down below from the terrace of his castle. Just one more, and our list and Glasheim would be unleashed. He besieged all the meek and drifting together and know the bliss of whirling within the heaven of his boundless soul. <laughs> For that was his promise to the friend who broke him. And that's when the chapter finished. Whoa, that, that that's a lot of deaths. Uh, right, seven out of eight, thirteen and thirteen. That's true. And eleven get to their evacuate finished. So, with that, let's end the episode as well, and in the next one, we should begin the next chapter. So, for now, hope you enjoyed it, and see you then. Bye-bye.